Hey guys, this is Miss Tyree and Ellie. This is my puppy. I thought it would be fitting to finish our book with Ellie with me. She loves to, to just kind of be held. She's not necessarily a rescue dog like Ranger, but she's a lot of fun. So I figured she could end the story with us, chapters 13, 14, and 15 right now, and it will be over. And last time we left Paul, he was in a lot of trouble. So I've been a little bit, uh, I've been anxiously waiting to read 13, 14, and 15 to you guys. So here we go. We'll get comfy, Ellie. Chapter 13, Grab the Rope. Behind Ranger, the air was full of screams and cries, splashes and neighs and snorts, but Ranger ran straight for the wagon. He had seen rope earlier when Ma and Pa prepared the wagon for the ferry crossing, but where was it now? Ranger jumped onto the tailgate and climbed between two barrels of flour. He spotted a rope that secured a trunk to the side of the wagon, but when he bit and tugged, it just it pulled the ropes tighter. There had to be more rope. Rope that was strong enough and long enough and not all tied up in something. Ranger jumped over a wooden trunk and sniffed at the tools that hung along the side of the wagon. Iron, steel, rust. Finally, he smelled something else, fiber and sweat, and he found a thick coil of rope tucked behind a crate of dried fruit. Ranger clamped his teeth on the rope and tugged as hard as he could. The rope came loose. Ranger took the end in his mouth, leapt from the wagon, and ran for the riverbank. Lizzie held Isaac in her arms and clutched Amelia's hand. Sam was with Mom, practically holding her up as they shouted to Mr. Harrigan over the raging water. Dr. Loring called to the other men for help. Ranger raced up to Sam and thrust the rope into his hands. You brought rope. Sam grabbed it, but Ranger tugged the end back and plunged into the water. With the rope in his teeth, he swam past Mr. Harrigan and Bess towards the place where he'd last seen Pa. The air was wet and full of smells. Horse sweat, river plants, fish. And Ranger caught the scent of death, too, rising up from the water. There were bodies down there. But Pa, he was still alive. Ranger could smell him. His scent got stronger as Ranger let the river carry him further downstream. There was still no sign of Paw in the water, and Ranger was getting tired. The current fought against him. It tugged at his rope and whipped a loop around his legs. He had to kick them free to keep swimming. It got harder and harder to keep his head out of the water so he could see. Ranger knew he couldn't last much longer. He'd have to let go of the rope and swim to shore. He'd have to rest and breathe and try again. But would Paul's alive and fighting smell be so strong then? The rope jerked tight. Ranger almost lost it, but he clamped his teeth down hard and held on. Ranger felt the water rushing past him. He'd run out of rope. Sam held tight to the other end on the bank. Ranger couldn't go any further without letting go. Ranger struggled to lift his head. He couldn't see Sam or Mr. Harrigan anymore, but he caught a splash in the water. Just as a dog's length or two away, he, a hand shot out of the waves, flailing at the air, grabbing at nothing. Then, for a flash of a moment, Ranger saw Paul's terrified face, grasping for breath before he was swept under again. Ranger kicked as hard as he could back upstream. He had to battle the current to move even the tiniest bit. The rope scratched his mouth and his tongue. The river slapped at his face, but Ranger swam as hard as he could. Finally, his paw touched something solid, the rough, wet fabric of Paul's shirt. Paul's arm jerked away, and then his head popped out of the water. He coughed, taking in great, desperate gulps of air. His arms flopped and slapped at the river as he tried to stay afloat. The rope! Ranger swam closer. Here, he thought, take it! In the swift water training with Dad and Luke, the person had taken the rope right away. Ranger had been watching from the boat. The rope came, and the person grabbed it and got saved. But this was different. Training hadn't smelled like this, like fear and panic, like coughed up river water. Ranger swam right up beside Paul, kicked him in the shoulder and poked him in the ear with his nose. Finally, Paul's eyes focused on the dog and then yes, he lunged at the rope. Sam must have seen Paul's hand close around because right away the rope pulled tight again. Ranger wasn't sure Paul, Paul was, Ranger wasn't sure Paul was strong enough to keep hanging on, so he tried to swim behind him, but Ranger was exhausted, and the current was strong. It, it was starting to pull him away from Paul, away from the rope and safety. But then Paul flung an arm around Ranger and held him tightly until they finally saw Sam tugging on the rope. Sam cried when he finally saw his Paul. He and Dr. Loring pulled Paul and Ranger all the way 
into shore until the water was shallow, until the water was shallow enough for Paul to crawl. Then they splashed out to help him to dry land. Paul coughed up some water, then flopped onto his back and looked up at the sky. Ranger stood in the mud and looked up too. It felt like something should happen. He'd rescue Paul. Would Luke come and take him home now? And when he heard the words, good job, it was Sam's voice, not Luke's. You're such a good boy. Sam put his face close to Ranger's. I love you, dog. Ranger loved Sam too, but he was still all wet. Ranger shook water onto Sam and everyone laughed. Nothing had ever sounded so good. I bet that laughter was a welcome from all the sad and the screaming. Later, when all the clothes were hung up to dry, Ma gave Ranger that slab of bacon she'd promised. You deserve more than that, dog. She patted him on the head and Ranger wolfed down all the meat. Sam wasn't eating. Ma raised her eyebrows. Did all that adventure steal your appetite? Sam shrugged. He'd been quiet all night and Ranger thought he felt warm. Maybe too warm. Ranger sniffed at Sam's temple and whined. Ma squatted down next to Sam and put her hand on his forehead. Ranger felt the air change again. The smell of fear was back before it even came out of Ma's voice. Get the medicine chest, Lizzie, he's burning up. Chapter 14, Fever Dreams. Sam didn't eat anything at supper or at breakfast the next morning. Ma and Pa settled him into some blankets piled on the trunk, oh, on a trunk in the wagon, and he rode there for the next three days. Ranger walked alongside Lizzie and Amelia, but every time the wagon stopped, he leapt onto the back and found his way back to Sam. Dr. Lauren came by at the end of every day on the trail. He cut Sam's arm so the bad blood would drain out. But Sam still shivered under the scratchy wool blanket. Ma was afraid he had cholera like Sarah's mother and father. But Dr. Loring pointed to the red spot spreading from Sam's wrist to his ankles right up to his, le right up to his legs. He's got rash. It's dangerous, but I think he's going to make it. On the morning of the fourth day, Sam's skin wasn't so hot. He even got up and walked behind the wagon for a bit. But when night fell, the fever came back, and it was worse, much worse. Sam was shaking his head and twitching his limbs as if some invisible wolf had gotten a hold of him. Dr. Loring came and gave Sam some medicine, but he spit it back up. Dr. Loring turned to Ma and shook, her, shook his head. The second phase it is usually worse than the first. All we can do is pray. Come on, dog, get down, Lizzie called. The ranger would not leave Sam's side. When Luke was sick last year, ranger had stayed with him the whole time, sleeping beside him in bed. Luke had gotten better. Sam would too. He had to, didn't he? Days passed, but Sam didn't improve. When Sam shivered, Ranger curled up close to him. When Sam cried out, Ranger licked his hand. Mostly Ranger just sat beside him, keeping watch. Ranger heard Lizzie say they were almost to the Oregon Territory. Any day, Uncle Thomas would come down the river to meet them and see them back to the farm. Sam had to get better. He'd waited so long to see this new country. Ranger ate the scraps that were offered at night, but nothing tasted the same when Sam wasn't eating. The days blurred together until finally, Ranger woke up one morning to find Sam sitting up beside him, blinking into the shining sun. Good morning, dog, I'm thirsty and hungry, I think. Ranger wasn't sure what Sam wanted, but he understood the most important thing. Sam was back. Ranger barked and Ma came running. She was just about smothered Sam in hugs and cornbread. When Sam stood up, his legs weren't as wobbly as a newborn, his legs were as wobbly as a newborn colt, but the color was coming back to his cheeks. At the end of the day, a wagon appeared on the trail coming from the other direction. Ma raised her hand to shade her eyes from the sun. William, I, I do believe it's your brother's team. Lizzie gathered her skirts in her arms and broke into a run. Even though he, would he was still weak, Sam took Amelia's hand and followed them. Uncle Thomas! The wagon stopped alongside, a tr alongside the trail. A sturdy-looking man jumped down from his horse and came running with a floppy-eared dog alongside him. Uncle Thomas looked a little older than Pa with the same scruffy hair and green eyes. He rushed up to the abbot's wagon, hugging Ma and fussing over the baby and telling Amelia how grown up she was. The dog nearly knocked Amelia off her feet. Finnegan, Uncle Thomas called, and the dog barked. Leave that little miss alone. 
Finnegan jumped up on Sam and nuzzled his hand. Does Finnegan live on the farm? Sam asked. Uncle Thomas nodded. Oh yeah, he'll wake you up every morning, I promise. Did you hear that dog? Sam turned to the wagon where Ranger had been standing watch. Ranger barked and tipped his head, but he stayed by the wagon. He had heard Uncle Thomas, he had heard Sam, and now he heard something else. A high-pitched humming coming from inside the wagon. It was getting louder and louder. Ranger hopped up on the tailgate and found it right away. The metal box from the garden at home was there. Where Ma had tucked it next to the tools on that first day, way back in the dusty square, the box was vibrating urgently. Ranger had done a good job. Now it's time to go home. Ranger grabbed the leather strap with his teeth, dragged it to the wagon's tailgate, and jumped down. Sam was watching him. Ranger knew he couldn't leave without saying goodbye. Everyone was getting ready to start off again to finish the journey. The metal box was humming so loud it seemed to be shaking the whole earth. The ranger sat it down in the dirt, ran next to Sam, and licked his hand. Doc, this is Finnegan, Sam said, squatting down to introduce them. Finnegan nuzzled Sam's ear, then turned to look at Ranger curiously. Who are you? The other dog seemed to ask. Finnegan sniffed Ranger, knowing he didn't quite belong. We're going home now, Sam said. To the farm. Ranger sniffed Finnegan. He was a good dog. He'd take care of Sam. Sam, come along, Pa called. We need to make 10 more miles before dark. Ranger licked Sam's hand once more and then turned away. Where are you going, dog? Sam looked confused. He stood up and one of the quilt squares fluttered down from his pocket. Aren't you coming? Ranger sniffed the square, then picked it up in his teeth. You, you wanna carry that for me? Here. Sam took the bit of fabric and tucked it under his collar. All set now. Let's go, son, Paul called. That dog will follow if he wants to. We need to get moving. But Sam didn't move. He watched Ranger trot back to the first aid kit and sit down. Finally, Sam nodded as if he understood. Thanks, dog, he said quietly. The Ranger heard. Even over the humming and the th that threatened to swallow him up, he watched Sam run to catch up with Lizzie and Finnegan in the wagon. When Ranger nuzzled the dusty leather strap over his head, the humming drowned out all the sounds of the trail, the snorting, the shouting, the clomping oxen, and the neighing of horses. Ranger saw a pinprick of white light that grew bigger and bigger until it swallowed up the Oregon sun, and Ranger had to close his eyes. When he opened them, there was a squirrel. The squirrel crouched at the bottom, 15, home. The squirrel crouched at the bottom of the oak tree, its muscles twitching as if it might race back up to the leaves any second. Ranger sniffed the air. He smelled squirrel. He smelled fresh grass and gasoline and the twang of dad's lawnmower. He smelled Luke and Sadie and pizza. And somewhere still buried in the garden nut bone that he buried a long time ago, the squirrel twitched again. Instead of running up to the tree, it took off towards the picnic table before Ranger could even think he was chasing it. Legs flying behind him, ears perked up, nose sniffling ahead of him. Squirrel! He raced three times around the picnic table, threw mom's flowers across the garden, and then zip! The squirrel raced up the oak tree and vanished. Poor Ranger, another one got away. You want a treat, boy? Ranger turned and saw Luke open the kitchen door. He bent down and held out his hand with half a slice of bacon in his palm. Ranger rushed up to him, panting, and gobbled it up. Bacon! Home bacon! Ranger followed Luke inside the mudroom, still licking grease from his muzzle. What's that? Luke reached for the first aid kit that clung around Ranger's neck. Ranger stood still while Luke lifted the strap and studied the rusty tin box. Then he noticed the quilt square and slipped it from under Ranger's collar. Did you dig this up in the garden? That's pretty cool. Let's show mom. He started off without thinking Ranger barked. Luke turned his eyes wide. What? Ranger trotted up to Luke and carefully took the leather strap and quilt square in his teeth. He tugged until Luke let go. Okay, fine. You found the stuff. It's all yours. What are you going to do with it? Ranger carried it to his dog bed. Luke laughed. Well, I guess that's a good place to keep your treasures. Good job. You're a good boy, Ranger. He scratched Ranger's ear. Ranger leaned in and wagged his tail. He'd waited so long to hear those words. 
When Luke left, Ranger settled into his dog bed. He was tired. But before he went to sleep, he nuzzled the first aid kit. It was quiet now. The humming had stopped. Ranger poked at the kit with his nose until it was tucked into the folds of his blanket. Then he curled up and gave the quilt square a good long sniff. Sam's scent still clung to the fabric. Ranger could smell Ma too. Her mix of wildflowers and worry and Lizzie and Amel Amelia and trail bacon and oxen, but mostly Sam. Somehow Ranger knew Sam was home now too. I'll show you the picture. At the very end, I really like that story. What a great book. Incredible. Um, this is a little bit of the author's note. It just says, imagine saying goodbye to your house, almost all of your friends and your extended family, and most likely all of your possessions. Imagine leaving everything you know to begin a long, long journey to a new home in a place you've never seen. Sam and his family are fictional, but their story is inspired by the diaries and journal journals of many real life people who wrote a little bit each night as they traveled west on the overland trails that led not only to Oregon territory but, territory, but also to California and the Great Salt Lake. This trip usually took five months. That's if everything went well. Wow, pretty cool. And there is a, there's quite a bit in the author's note here. So I uh, definitely, if you guys get a chance to check this book out, this is a good one. So we're gonna start a new book soon. Ellie and I would like to thank you for letting us read with you, and we will talk to you guys later. Bye!